An important part of our education at William & Mary are our legal clinics. We have nine legal clinics, and in each clinic, a student has the opportunity to represent a person that has a real legal problem from start to finish. So these legal clinics do a few things for us. They're a wonderful practical training experience for our students, but they're also a marvelous place to provide service to people that do not have legal representation. One of our best known clinics is our Lewis Puller Veterans Benefits Clinic. There are many service members who are coming back from foreign battlefields who have suffered injuries and they are entitled under law to disability benefits to account for the injuries that they have suffered. But the process by which you pursue these benefits is very, very difficult and it's very complicated. And so we represent them and it's been an incredible experience for our students to be able to work with these service members to whom the nation made a promise that if you fight for us, we will take care of your needs if you are injured and wounded. And so we help vindicate that promise that our nation has made to service members in this legal clinic. The Polar Clinic is one of the best examples I've seen, and as somebody who's visited lots of law schools around the Commonwealth and around the country, uh, a school saying, let's identify a problem, let's be forward-leaning, take on a part of the government that is, let's face it, way too bureaucratic, the Veterans Administration, and say, we're not gonna let our clients in this case, the veterans down. We're gonna figure out a way to help these veterans get the benefits they deserve. I can't think of anything we could do more for our veterans than to see a veterans law clinic modeled on the Puller Clinic in every law school across America. One, two, three. Okay? Okay. All right. Very first inkling something was wrong. I used to jog a lot. And I started tripping the blades of grass, what it felt like. But went to the doctor and the nerves were getting screwed up. And uh, you never knew when when you were gonna trip or whatever, what caused it. Like this hand now, it's having trouble with my right right hand. It'll, it'll just start shaking. That's frustrating. The Grays are a terrific couple, just wonderful, sweet people. And he served at Takli Air Force Base during the Vietnam era, but that was where he was um, stationed. And they sprayed Agent Orange there. Um, they sprayed it outside the base, they claim, um, and he obviously was located on the base. So uh, Mr. Gray has Parkinson's. Um, Parkinson's is something that is presumed to be from Agent Orange. There's no Parkinson's in his family. The Grays are certain that this is connected to his Agent Orange exposure. But the position of the Department of Veterans Affairs is that because he was on the base, then he was not exposed. I was looking for a date when I started all this. Actual date. Here, August 9th was one, so it was somewhere around that time, August 9th, 2010, that we started. Uh, it was a very lengthy and put it nicely, very frustrating. It was very frustrating because we really didn't get any results. Um, you send them something and they tell you 290 days or 293 days before you hear back. They send you something, they want it back in 10 days. We applied for benefits for him and uh, he was turned down for the Parkinson's. And the reason being mostly because he didn't apply for it within you know, a year after he was exposed. Well, you, you, symptoms don't show up that soon. So he was turned down. Then I was at one of my caregiver support group and one of the other ladies, she said, call Rob Whitman's office. Um, he's our senator here. She says, they have lots of information. So I called there and the fellow I spoke to originally gave me more good information in 15 minutes than I had gotten in several years from the VA. 
and he also told me about the Puller Clinic at William and Mary and they have been absolutely wonderful. When they took this case, I felt like the weights had been taken off my shoulders because uh, it was just so frustrating. Shane's a terrific student. Shane came in not because he was going to do veterans law, um, but I think that he felt that he had something to give and that this was a worthwhile um, community to give back to. And he did the intake interview for the Grays. Their, their case really revolves around uh, an Agent Orange or herbicide exposure case um, in a Vietnam era setting. But it was more complicated than that because he was stationed in a Thailand Air Force base. So he wasn't in Vietnam. Veterans who step foot in Vietnam are presumed to have come in contact with Agent Orange. But that same presumption does not apply to veterans in Thailand. The presumption does apply if you're classified as one of two specialties either a dog handler or a security patrolman. And I looked at Mr. Gray's military occupational specialty and he was neither of those two things. But then you do a little bit more research and you look up in the manual, the M21R, and you see that there's this third exception, that if you were in regular contact with the perimeter, then you could also get the presumption for herbicide exposure, which would tremendously increase his chances of, of winning this case. Well, as it turns out, he worked on the flight line, which was on the perimeter. And what it also turns out is that he lived in the Screenwald Hooch, which was located on the other side of the perimeter. And every single day, he would jump on a bus that would travel along the perimeter roads, and he would stand on the perimeter waiting for that bus to arrive to pick him up to work. But the VA didn't even bother asking him that question. You know, they didn't even follow up to see if he fell into that third category. And so we brainstormed, how do you prove that? Shane took it upon himself to do some research, did so, and got a map of the base, and, uh, and went over that with that map um, and the Grays, where Mr. Gray had worked, where he slept every night, where the bus went on the perimeter of the base. So by doing that, he was able to show in our evidence that he was regularly exposed to the air close to the perimeter. That would have, I think, been compelling enough. But then, in talking to the Grays, we learned that Mr. Gray loved to take pictures, and Mrs. Gray had them. Yeah, here's Hooch. This is a, uh, you can see them here, they, like apartments, if you will, or whatever. That goes from one side to the other and both sides there are no windows as such everything was louvers and you can see it here and up here so when the wind blew a thunderstorm anything that stuff just blows right through and uh, i thought to myself that that's where you get a a, a pretty heavy exposure so there's a, a ton of photographs that we were able to dig through and um, I was able to extract the ones that demonstrate, well, here's his hooch, and we can see back here, that's the perimeter. And so we can see that he lived in these quarters for 12 months, and he stood on this road, on this perimeter, where herbicides were sprayed as he was waiting for the bus every single day. And then we have photos of the flight line. Here he is working on the flight line. You know, he's not making this up. You can see on the flight line photo images that in the background, that's also the perimeter. He had to work on the perimeter every single day. And you know, when you start showing these photographs and they start telling this compelling story, it really adds value to the case. And you know, they would never have known the value of those photographs if it you know, wasn't for finding these regulations and digging through these cases. I mean, to, to expect a, a veteran or even Linda Gray, for example, somebody who's caring for, someone who's suffering from Parkinson's disease to look through these cases and find out that they need to find photographs like this. And that's just extremely, that's unreasonable. Nobody does that. This is what Shane put together, I'm sure with Professor Robert's help. Um, right here, all of this, documenting when Bill was there, about the herbicides, when he rode the bus to um, his workplace, where he slept, the exposure, being off base, things like that. 
Um, he asked a lot of questions that when I applied for the disability really did not um, even think about. Uh, eventually, uh, we got our appointment and we went this past August to the Veterans Review Board. And all we have to do now is wait. The Polar Clinic continues to grow and be successful and the model continues to spread because there is such need and because we have amazing students who are passionate citizen lawyers to be. And I think a lot of people are recognizing at other law schools, at other corporations, at other institutions of higher education and community service organizations that it's not enough to say, well, the VA will take care of it or the government will take care of it, that we each have an obligation. The sense of pride that comes with the growth is not in the growth itself. It's that this is an opportunity for us who are not serving and sacrificing in that way to do something to help those who are.